at that point, I knew I could not fulfill having an event there, and it was crushing. Uh, but how did I how did I wake up the next morning? You just have to persevere. You're not going to succeed in every venture that you take. You got to lick your wounds, realize that you're a capable entrepreneur, you're a capable business person, and if you're not, you need to seek counsel from those that you trust. Welcome to Increase the Dosage. This is the show that strips away the facade of fake entrepreneurship. It removes the glamour, comes from the trenches, and provides the naked conversations, war stories, lessons learned, and the tools and tricks used by the successful entrepreneurs who overcame their challenges to achieve new growth so that you can too. Now, for your weekly shot of entrepreneurial adrenaline, here is your host, serial entrepreneur and venture catalyst, Chris J. Snook. Welcome, everybody. Chris J. Snook back for another episode of Increase the Dosage, your weekly shot of adrenaline for all things entrepreneurial and growth. And so today I'm excited because actually this interview uh, is happening because of wearing our gear in in an airport. So without further ado, we're going to get into a discussion with Jake Jones from Troops Direct on his entrepreneurial path and what they're up to and lessons learned. And so welcome to the show, Jake. Hey, thanks, Chris, for having me. I really so uh, it. you never thought probably by um, picking on a guy in a lounge that you'd end up on a podcast a couple weeks later, right? No, <laughs> not at all. I was uh, <laughs> I saw you. I was like, who's this big <laughs> gentleman? And why is he carrying a uh, gift wrap box with increased yeah. dosage? On well, it? I think we had, yeah, I think we were we were heading to Seattle, and then we were heading to Mount. I forget. We were going somewhere, and so we had product, and then we had uh, we had some of the. We had a gift, actually. That's what it was. We had a gift for my father-in-law, who was turning seventy, wrapped in startup drugs wrapping paper, which is one of the <laughs> new and, and new um, products that'll be launching on that site. And and then I, I I had on like our sweatshirt or whatever, our startup drug sweatshirt, and I kind of look over at you as we're feeding our faces in the lounge between flights, and you're like, I, I like that. I just looked. I, I just googled you or something. And I said, good, it's working. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. Well, then I'm perfect. glad, you know, we found out a little bit about what you did. So we'll get into that on the show. But quick background, and I'm just going to ask you about your entrepreneurial path, because I know you didn't come up through, you know, what um, would necessarily be a traditional path of entrepreneurship. We've had guests on who, you know, grew up in entrepreneurial families or or had lemonade stands, and then that turned into the next thing. And But the, the beautiful thing about our community is that entrepreneurship takes all kinds of forms here. And really, the purpose of this show is, is to uncover those forms and also the lessons around how people are navigating their path to basically do stuff, to create or to build a business or to make a difference or an impact and do it on their own terms, um, however that may be defined. So, you know, you are uh, someone who provided the ultimate service and the ultimate risk for uh, over two decades. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and you don't have to start maybe with the professional side, maybe were you an entrepreneurial kid? Did you grow up in a family that was in the military? Like, where did you come from? Yeah, so uh, I grew up in a small town called Woodbury, Connecticut. Uh, my dad was a techie, worked for Pitney Bowes. He was in Vietnam doing signals intelligence and then went through IBM, uh, Pitney Bowes, AT&T, and then ultimately was Cisco. Just coincidentally, my wife works for Cisco today. So moving forward, I always had a strong drive, very character-based leadership uh, initiative. Um, So I went through the Boy Scouts, became an Eagle Scout, and that kind of formed my job, my drive to be someone different. Didn't want to do the everyday thing, didn't want to go to college right away. Uh, So I joined the Marine Corps and uh, did that for 20 years, uh, background in both the conventional side and the special operations units. Um, Retired in 2018, and went to work for Troops Direct. It's a entrepreneurial business, and that's where yeah, I was yeah. So, uh, so you did come from a technology kind of background, and and the, so the Eagle Scouts thing was something that was like a, I don't want to say a turning point, but maybe something that un, awakened or unlocked this side of you that was I'm gonna I'm different or I'm going to be different, and that turns me on. I'm interested. Was it what was it? Do you remember specifically what it was? Like, was there a certain point? Because Eagle Scout is like, that's not something you just start and do. Like, I don't remember all the levels, but I have a cousin who was an Eagle Scout. I mean, it it's something that is a real commitment 
did you join like Cub Scouts and then Boy Scouts and then decide like day one, I'm going all the way through? Is that your personality or was it something more organic where you just kept doing the next thing and then before you knew it, you were at the kind of pinnacle of it. And then, and then after that, it was like, well, where do I go from here? And I'm going to go do something different. Like, was it a knowledge right out of the gate or was it something that unfolded, you know, organically as you started to just step through your adolescence? No, it definitely unfolded. And I don't want it to sound like a sob story, but like a lot of kids today, parents are getting divorced. They're looking for a resource. And the Boy Scouts was my resource while my parents were separated. So the Boy Scouts kind of gave me that framework to be who I want to be and to be the basically the captain of yourself. Anything you want to achieve, you can do it, but you got to do it with a strong moral character. You have to do it with good work ethic and people will follow you if you have those two things. So I just went through the years and I mean, it probably took me, I would say almost eight years to achieve the rank of Eagle Scout. And I did my final Eagle project. Uh, about two months before I shipped the Marine Corps boot. And was was the choice to do, I mean, you said, you know, college really wasn't the program at that point for you. Was the military based on the influence of your father, your time in the Eagle Scouts and, and Boy Scouts? Like, or was it just something that at that time felt like a calling and was like, no, that's where you've got to be the best of the best and you've got to, it was what was the draw? I mean, again, and I say this with all due respect because, like, you're not going to the Marine Corps despite what some of the ads are. I mean, you're you're basically putting your life on the line at a very young age. You're making a decision that could not end well, right? Like, and, and I'm and I'm saying sure. that not for anything other than just context. Like, that's a that's a big decision. So, what was the what was the catalyst to go that way versus going a gap year or you know, start a business or do something else that's risky, but that would have been a different scenario. I would say that uh, my grandfather was a Marine. Um, He served in Korea. Uh, My dad in the Navy during Vietnam. And I think from a very young age, that service above self, service to others is greater than one person and greater than you as an individual. So uh, I had hard conversations with my grandfather and my parents And I really believe that for me to be, I'm not taking away from anyone else who hasn't served, but for me personally, to be the greatest servant of my nation, I had to put on a uniform and and I chose the Marines. Fair enough. Well, I appreciate it as I'm sure anyone else uh, listening to this appreciates it. And so let's talk about then. So you're in the Marines for 20 years and we could talk about, so we have a format, you know, where we basically talk about some of the high points of your career. And then, and then we'll also dive into lessons learned through some of the low points. And, and again, your entrepreneurial journey came up through a path that was very, you know, uh, organizationally top down kind of military focused, but, but building a, you know, building an enterprise, building a business is, is about serving people too, serving your customers, serving your, your, your teammates, your employees, who, who, whoever you recruit to kind of go on this challenge with you. So there's a lot of parallels in service, or servant leadership, but I think the grounding of the ultimate form of servant leadership that you came out of is is a good baseline for that. So the lessons of coming over adversities and things like that that we'll talk about don't necessarily have to come from things you faced in Troops Direct. Maybe it, maybe it comes from things you faced at another point in your career, uh, either in the military or post-military before Troops Direct. So talk about some of the highs. Like, what are some of the things you've achieved, whether it was the Eagle Scout thing? Like, what are some of the moments where you realized that, that it was worth the continued effort to keep going because there were these things that you could latch on to as nuggets of, you know, achievement. What lists a couple out that meant something or still mean something to you to this day. What are you proud of? I think the biggest thing for, for any leader, um, their proudest moment should be the successes of their subordinates. That means that you are an effective leader. Um, so for me, uh, really being able to look my guys in the eyes when I was in combat or working through a problem set here in the United States to where we were successful. And they came back to me and said, hey, you know, what, Jake, you know, your servant leadership, your ability to walk us through the problem set through the desired end state, you showed us what it was like to make good ethical decisions in problems. And we appreciate that. So just hearing that, that good positive feedback I think for any leader, 
that is the biggest payoff, whether it's in business, military, it doesn't matter. It's just having that good feedback that you led your people effectively to accomplish a goal. That is the and, greatest. Uh, no doubt you've got several of those moments, I'm, I'm assuming, where I forget where you served, but you did tours in both Afghanistan and Iraq, or I can't remember from our prior conversation, but okay. And, and so from the special ops side, what are some of the things um, without breaking any uh, military, you know, intelligence kind of things, what are some of the things that you have to do or you had to do that you to just even achieve that level? You know, I know, I know several people that were in the seals and so I'm kind of familiar with budge training. I'm not, I'm not as familiar with, what you have to do to qualify or get into special ops in the Marine Corps. But I would imagine there was some highs there of achievement where you overcame through will and through focus or through whatever, uh, your own doubts about your ability to make it. Any Anything that stands out that you want to share that you think we can extrapolate from? Yeah. So first and foremost, like I'm, I'm not an operator, um, you know, for the Marine Corps. I was basically the guy in charge of that unit. Um, so I was a support guy. So I had a bunch of operators that I was tasked with leading, you know, care, feeding, leadership, professional development. That was kind of my ball. So their ability to perform was dependent on your ability to deliver what they needed. Absolutely. And so that was when you were in, in the military. And so that's a good segue and, and we'll kind of go back and forth here, but that's a good segue to probably what attracted you to Troops Direct. You know, the organization was formally set in 2010, I think, and and you joined the effort a couple of years back. When, when did you exactly come onto the team? Yeah, so I joined uh, upon my retirement in February 2018. I had been a beneficiary of Troops Direct. And this is a this is a you know an entrepreneurial organization, but it is a five hundred one c three, so it's it's essentially a social impact uh, foundation or company. And so there's there's opportunities and constraints that exist inside of that world that don't exist in the for profit world, but nonetheless, uh, entrepreneurial DNA and and um, execution is is required because uh, there's there's very few places as competitive as. um, the 501c3 market when you're talking about dollars uh, out in the market. So, um, and I and I would think, you know, when we first met, you started telling me about Troops Direct. The thing that surprised me was that there was even a need for some of the some of the things that you guys do, which sound like now they pair with what you were doing while you were in the military. Because it seems like preparedness and readiness and you know, feel the battle like on the field logistics or equipment provisioning is what you were doing to some degree as part of your effort when you were in the military and now kind of translates to you guys doing it from the private sector for the military through troops direct. Is that accurate or or I missed something up there? No, it's accurate. And it's, it's sad that I'm able to do more for guys in the military as a civilian, as I was as their senior leader. Um, When I was deployed, uh, my special operations unit was, fighting against ISIS in Mosul. One of the tasks that we got was to join a more higher end special operations unit and conduct this mission. And we didn't have everything that we needed. And there was no way in hell that we were going to get it in the time frame. So be specific. Like when you say you didn't have everything you needed, like um, I know, I know, but for those listening, they don't know what that means. So like, what is it? You, You had to go fight or go basically hit an objective and you needed certain things to do that. And those things would not arrive on time. Like what, what were those things and what was part of the problem that, that you faced when you were in that situation? So a lot of the, the stuff that we didn't have was just due to the fact that we needed to split the team into smaller units. So each team only has one set of X, right? Now you go down to two teams. Well, one's going with it. One's going without so what we needed was surveillance equipment. We were conducting a surveillance and reconnaissance operation on an ISIS stronghold. Um, and we needed some extra because we went to two teams or two elements, excuse me. So we requested um, some higher end laser range finders, some camera equipment, listening devices, recording devices, and then some higher end sniper scopes that we use for our precision. Got it. And so well. you had a set for the, I don't want to call it the platoon. But basically, for 
the unit, but then that unit had to carve up into micro units and you couldn't, you didn't have enough to go around. And Correct. you couldn't call base or wherever your, you know, uh, upline officer was and get that sent. No, and a lot of that has to do to just big government contracting. You know, contracting typically takes, you know, flash to bang uh, anywhere from three to nine months to procure a piece of equipment. And that even gets further elongated when you're overseas and in combat. So that's really what Troops Direct focuses on is being that backstop to the military government contracting pitfalls. So they can we can land anything in the globe. Um, within 10 days. And that's what we try and fix is ensuring that our service members don't go without. So when you, yeah. So backing up, because essentially what you did is you joined this organization in its, when, when there was maybe two other people that had founded it. So you were, you're basically like a late, you know, a late co-founder slash late executive, early, early operations person in this early stage effort that, that kind of organically grew, but you also joined uh, because you had faced, you had been on the customer side, the customer being in this case, the platoon leader or the mission leader or whoever it is that's actually out in the field that just got word that intelligence has changed and we need to go do something. And, you know, we don't have the equipment to go do it. And this could be everything from surveillance gear to helmets to, I mean, what is the gamut of things that, you know, fall short because of this big government contracting supply chain and that you guys at Troop Directs have delivered. I'm just curious, like what are the, what's the gamut of equipment you've delivered? Yeah. So we're not the typical 501c3 military charity. We don't do cookies and candy. We do mission specific. Yeah, you're not handing equipment. out care packages so, to the guys or sending them playboys. You're, you're giving them like real stuff. No, we have terrific partnerships with, um, Vortex Optics, Night Force Optics. Um, we work with tactical distributors. So body armor, boots, uniforms, helmets, eye protection, uh, scopes, laser range finders. We send chalk, uh, engineer chalk, so that the uh, combat engineers and explosive ordnance technicians can mark mines because we run out of it all the time over there. I mean, we were marking IEDs with water bottle caps so we wouldn't step on them. So having that uh, fluorescent chalk creates much more of a visible do not step on than just a water bottle cap. Uh, I mean, we've done full on Volvo generators. Our pitch is, or not our pitch, but our saying is we ship anything that doesn't go boom or bang. And that's exactly what it means. Upon the service member's request, I will vet, I will verify the need through my network. And if I feel it's appropriate, I will ship them anything they ask for within our budgetary. It's control. a really unique, it's, it's one of these problems that for many people, when we're talking about $800 billion a year defense budgets are shaking their heads, listening to this going, how could this even be an issue? Right. And, and without getting yeah. down that rabbit hole, cause I don't think that's what this is about. The reality is, is it's an issue. There's a, there's a, there's just a constraint in the supply chain that is related to the size of that supply chain that, prevents it from being as nimble as is needed in the theater dynamics that we deal with today, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I had one Green Beret, he got shot to the side of the face. It wasn't a, a grievous wound. He was able to stay in country, but it also blew out his Kevlar, so he didn't have a helmet. And he had been requesting a helmet for two and a half months through the supply chain, and they couldn't get it. He called me. And I ordered it for him. And how did he months. find you other than word of mouth? And, and, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of the go to market. What's the go to market strategy that's worked the best to drive awareness around this? And I would imagine the demand far out uh, exceeds your ability to supply it, which is part of your operational challenges or, or opportunities to be moving forward. But yeah. how do these guys hear about you or find you? I mean, obviously, you have a website and stuff, but when they're out in wherever the heck they are, how do they know to call you and how is that secure and all that stuff? You know, a lot of it's just word of mouth because I try and deal with, you know, within my own circle of trust. So people that I trust will reach out to other people that they trust. And we just continue to grow those concentric circles of, of trust. 
And as a 501c3, you have to have trust within the people you're working with. So that's the greatest platform that we use. We also use social media. Um, our website, troopsdirect.org, is also live. So that's our main methods of, of contact. So if a service member gets jammed up overseas, they just go to our website. They'll fill out the request uh, form online. We don't deal with anything classified. Everything is above board. Um, and then I'll vet the request. I'll contact them through either WhatsApp or Signal or you know some sort of con- uh, secure method. And then we'll have a dialogue and I'll order the stuff. And, and are the suppliers, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on your site just looking at, I like this graphic where you have the little, uh, you have the soldier and then you have like the little icons that say these are the commonly requested items. I think, again, a lot of this would, would uh, I don't want to say shock, but surprise is probably the right word. Most people, you know, helmets and communications equipment, eye and hand protection, trauma and rescue, like talking about first aid kits and stuff, I'm assuming there, um, body armor carriers, replacement camouflage uniforms and replacement footwear. And, and so I'm assuming that these things are all in the supply chain as it currently is. These things are approved or, or there's certain vendors that sell the military camo uniforms because I would imagine they have to be of a certain skew or type. I'm, I'm guessing you have the same relationships with the same preferred vendors or do you have like, how does that work just from a sourcing standpoint? Um, And what are the specs around that? So that, you know, the troops are getting a helmet from someone that uh, is approved by the military in the event that something bad happens and there's lawsuits and like all this other stuff. Like how do, how does all that get sorted out? I'm just curious. Yeah, so we deal with the you know the trusted vendors and the manufacturers of the equipment. All of it that we source from them is approved by the U.S. government. We're not bound by the Berry Amendment or Textiles Act, anything like that, as a private organization. And that's what makes us really agile. Is I you know I could do it through e-commerce, or I could buy a ladder from Norway and have it shipped in at the drop of a hat. So that's really what makes us really agile. Is we can do. Any B2B, B2G purchase order that we want. And that's really what separates us from the way that things are done in the government, because a lot of that government contracting, those businesses know that they have that government contract. So they're going to upsell that item. They're going to tack on an additional 30%. Well, I don't because I'm one, completely privately funded, so I can't pay those prices, but I'm going to get that item and ship it at the drop of a hat. So that's what separates us and kind of makes us the backstop or the quick reaction force for the government's inefficiencies. Yeah. And and looking at the way you guys have quantified some of this, I think it's, I think it's well done, you know, from a purely entrepreneurial kind of digital marketing standpoint. uh, I like how, you know, you've said, how does my donation make a difference? And then you've quantified like what different amounts mean. Again, now we're talking a little bit about marketing techno- tactics and also just instilling clarity into, you know, where the money's going and what it actually does. A hundred dollars gives me two pairs of two pairs of ballistic eye protection, one pair of replacement boots, or two stretchers. So, in other words, if someone's sitting there going, "Well, I like this and I want to give a hundo," I can quantify what that's actually going to get for somebody in the field and what it what it costs to create an open account for one infantry regiment. How many people are in a regiment? It's probably about really? 3,000. So, yeah. wow. Okay. So if there's, call it 2,500 even, you know, if there's 2,500 people in a regiment, which would be small because you said 3,000, but I'm looking at this, that, that essentially a quarter million dollars covers that entire uh, infantry regiment for anything they might need. And you have 5,000 American troops here, but essentially we're talking about not a lot of money on a per head basis to make sure there's no gaps. I mean, that's, it's it's a cool way that you've organized this and just for what it's worth looking at it. I think it's, it's powerful. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about personally something that you learned from a day that did not go well and you can pick it, whether it was 15 years ago or whether it was 15 seconds ago, I, I'm going to stick with the theme you laid out here on this one around success is judged by those who you serve. And, and so let's talk about a time that you're willing to share where, Jake was not feeling good about himself because 
quite frankly, in your mind or in reality, you or your system, whatever you were overseeing, failed and let down the objective. And then other than what it was and how you felt, what did you take away from it? What did you learn? And, and for someone who might be feeling that today, what can they do to, uh, to get out of bed tomorrow because of something you learned or that they were inspired by by you doing it? Yeah, I think, you know, recently uh, I started a, a venture called Operator Weekend, and we had a successful one on the West Coast, um, and I tried to launch one on the East Coast in, in South Carolina, and the location was great. The capabilities they had were just unmatched. I mean, active duty special operators have trained there. So as I continue to build this plan out, you know, I, I was getting within – you know, 45 days to execution. And I just didn't have enough people to sign up for the event. Uh, I think at that time, I only had eight people. And what I realized was, Jake, you're, you need to cancel this event and roll these people over to the next one. And that was a really hard pill for me to swallow. And what I realized was, when you have a great idea, before you move to the execution phase, you have to build out the logistical network, you have to build out the support network and really do your research to find out if, is this even sustainable in that location? And if it's not, then you need to move on. You need to find a new location because all that matters is the end state of your organization's success. At that point, I knew I could not fulfill having an event there and it was crushing. Um, but how did I, how did I wake up the next morning? You just have to persevere. You're not going to succeed in every venture that you take. You got to lick your wounds, realize that you're a capable entrepreneur, you're a capable business person. And if you're not, you need to seek counsel from those that you trust and then build a better business plan or build a better project plan. What did you communicate? So <clears throat> I think this is a really good one. So you, you put one on the map. It went well, meaning it worked for the attendees. It worked financially for the organization. It even got you a promotion. I'm summarizing here, but I'm based on your bio. Essentially, the first operator weekend that you did was part of what made you currently COO of, of Troops Direct. It worked well. It generated a new revenue source that was not just donations. The engagement level was high. It had the right people doing the right things, um, telling the right story. Yak, yak. And so then you went to do another one in the East Coast, sounds like. And that one got to a point where there was a go, no go decision. You had already recruited people. You'd already spent some money. You already had done a bunch of things, but you had to make a call because if you didn't, you were either, I'm assuming the binary decision was we're either going to have one of these and it's going to suck. Meaning like eight people are going to show up, but it's, we're going to lose money. It's not going to go well for the attendees, which means then we're going to lose the credibility of the thing we already have established was good. What were some of the things that you just were, because at some point it was a judgment call, right? I mean, it was, it was a judgment yeah. call. And so there was a standard in your mind of what it was and what it needed to be the next outing, meaning it had to exceed the first one, but it was something now. There was a thing that was a minimum level and you felt on all the inputs that as bad as it would be to say, we can't do it and you have to communicate that 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 would be better than doing it and having it be less than what was expected. Yeah. I mean, that event, um, it was a phenomenal event. I mean, we were jumping out of planes. We had some of the highest tier uh, national level operators coming down for this. I had general officers coming in for this, guest speakers, even had a Medal of Honor recipient that was going to be in attendance. But what I realized was of the eight attendees that I had signed up, and this is a $10,000 per person. And essentially, just for people that don't know, what this is, is this is where people like myself could go experience what it's like and be trained by or educated by real battle-tested you know, professionals, not just on the experience of what it's like to go through and do all these things, surveillance, jumping out of planes, but actually be trained and be made aware of other ways that they could protect our organization or be a better leader. Like it's, it's that, right. It's a leadership development on steroids kind of program. Correct. Yeah. I, I can scale, I can scale this model in any direction that I want. So, you know, that one is just, it's a full immersion experience. 
with special operators. It's a way for the donors to sit eye to eye, hear the stories of deployment stories, successes, how those donors made an impact in that operator's life while deployed. On the, on the other side of it, I've had interest from uh, two national level organizations to make this their corporate event. So I, I was going to bring in um, psychologists to talk about the psyche of a special operator, the decision making cycle, how that directly interprets and directly relates into business to be successful. So I, I could do this in any which way direction. If, gotcha. If so when you had the eight, you were saying you had eight people. And you were trying to make an yeah. assessment around who those eight were and whether they were the right folks or whether you could get more of them and enough of them or what was the, so what was the decision there? I interrupted, but I wanted to make sure people understood what the actual thing was. So go back to that. Yeah. I, I would say like my min number was Got 10, it. but I, I was comfortable with eight. But what I realized was of that eight, six were all in one group. So I thought about that from, from a customer's experience perspective. You know, hey, I'm signing up for this great event, but yet I'm hanging out with the same six people that I know all the time. That to me doesn't seem like a very positive experience when you're trying to grow your network of friends and, and have great networking opportunities with, with some very successful people just to be sitting with six of your closest friends and then two people you just met. So at that point, I knew uh, as to be a steward of their of their donated dollar to us, I had an obligation to put on a, a top notch event. And I, I made very hard phone calls. and I was very honest with these people and said, look, my obligation to you is to provide you the best experience you'll ever have in your life. And right now I'm going to refund your ten thousand dollars and I'm going to move you forward to the next one. And I promise you, I will not let you down. And, and frankly, there were some very successful C-suite owners of corporations, and they said, Jake, that's the best decision I've ever had anybody make, is to just come with me honestly with an assessment and tell me the truth. Thank you. So, and you actually, and, and I was going to get there, and you, I'm glad you went there on your own. Um, you know, I wanted to know, like, what, what was that phone call like, and then what was the net outcome of it? Um, so you actually did refund the money or you offered to, did they, did they say, great, let us know when the next one is and we're in. Did they say, don't worry about it. Just keep it on deposit until you do the next one and left it as like, you know, work and process income to be earned at a future date. What was the, what was the net outcome of that? And then when, when is the next one? And, and what did you learn that you have positioned now for the next one from a marketing and an outreach standpoint to make sure that it's going to be successful? Yeah, so of the of the eight people, only one asked for their money back. The other seven said, "Hey, hold it, put us into the next one." So the next one, and, and frankly, all eight have signed That's up awesome. for the next one. The next one is is three through, three through six October, just outside of Reno, Nevada. Uh, I'm actually flying out there next week to sign all the contracts with everybody we're doing business with. And I think the reason why that one is much more successful than the East Coast is because we're a West Coast-based organization. Uh, we're based out of San Ramon, California. So the network there in the Bay Area is much more expansive than it is on the East Coast. So as a leader, I had to sit down and look through my marketing plan and realize that I'm weak on the East Coast. So what I'm focusing on now is attacking the East Coast to saturate the market with our mission um, and and just grow awareness for our brand and get it out there. Excellent. And so I think I would unpack that a couple of ways. I mean, first of all, the, the number one thing is, is that being fearlessly honest is, is the thing that always is right to do. It's the thing that's also hardest to do. But when you value relationships or you value and you're really in the business of serving those who you exist to provide value to, which is kind of what you started off with, it's the only really option, right? It's the only option is to treat them as such and to treat them as partners in, in your success, even if they're the ones paying you, right? And and I, I can only imagine that off the back of something successful and on a growing yet very small uh, and capital intensive business, which is what you guys are, that it's never easy to shut something down when you're only too short. But you made the call and you were going to live with the results either way. And you felt better about it the minute you did it, it sounds like. And um, and then that was rewarded in this case with, 
you know, people support and, and, and now you have time to figure out how to get enough groundswell on the East coast to maybe bring one over there. But in the meantime, operationally, you're focusing on just like every startup, limited resources, limited opportunities and density of market. So you're going to go stick where your customers already are and then use that as a stepping stone. So those are some of the lessons that I peeled out of that. I, I, if you want to add any, please feel free. But I mean, I think it's a great example of, of just growing pains and, and integrity working together. I think you, those are all great points. But one thing I would like to point out is, you know, I could have taken it in the shorts on that one and just said, you know, screw it. I'm going to push through. But I am hyper, hyper focused on the donors dollars and what we do with them. And, and I'm proud to say that 88 to 90 percent of our of our annual budget goes directly to purchasing gear to send overseas. I mean, that's a very positive number. There's a lot of not-for-profits that don't have that. So that's another reason why I did that is say, I got to be a good steward of their dollars and I yeah. can't do this. Well, and, and you're playing for the long, you know, you're playing for the long haul too. This isn't something that is going to happen overnight at scale and yet it needs to be scaled. Right. And, and, um, yeah. you know, so I, I, I appreciate it. I think, and, and the fact that it's such a near term one, I, I really, acknowledge the fact since we don't know each other that well and just recently met that you feel comfortable enough to to share with our audience that look this isn't something that happened five years ago that now I'm on the back side of and I can point to like it was the best decision ever we're now crushing it and whatever this is something that literally was a couple months ago and that um the outcome of which is still TBD because October 3rd is you know several months away and so I, I just I really appreciate it on behalf of the audience because that's the kind of stuff we're trying to cultivate here, which is this community of of support for one another, people that are in the game. And it's because it's not a battle. It's a game. Right. This entrepreneurship is a game. It's a serious game, but it's not battle. Battle is battle. And um, and, you know, but this is a fun and yet challenging and serious game with real world consequences. People do get hurt financially here or emotionally here. And so it is serious. And um and you took a, you know, pragmatic and yet tough step that was based on where you were heading and not where you currently were. And, and I acknowledge you for that. I think a lot of people can learn from that and should make that tough decision in their business today if they need to, knowing that, you know, one way or the other, the right thing to do is always the right thing to do. Even if it, even if it means yep. you're not going to be doing this one forward, meaning even if it costs you the company. The right thing to do is the right thing to do because if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to do something else later, and your relationships and your 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 integrity are, are all you really have, your reputation and your and your self worth, quite frankly. Yeah, it, it, we have a saying in, in the military that you know there's the the hard right or the easy wrong, and and that's where I've always kind of nested myself is is making that hard right decision. No matter what the cost, whether it's personal reputation, professional reputation, because you're accountable to the people that support you. And if they lose faith in your character, you're just done. No matter where you are in business, people just aren't going to want to work with you. But it all worked out in the long run, making that hard decision, because this next event in October is almost completely sold out. So I I'm happy. With yeah, that. I would be, too. And and if there's is as we wind this up, I would say as it relates to increasing your dosage and, and supporting you further, you'll tell us where to go. But I think other than troopsdirect.org and following you uh, wherever you want us to on social media and all those things, um, how is the best way that, you know, startup drugs and, and the rest of the community and, and increase the dosage listeners can support you and your efforts at Troops Direct? I mean, give us a plug. Yeah, I would say the best way to do it is, is just brand awareness, understanding that there's service members out there over 130 countries, 365 days a year that go without. And they can't get everything they need through the typical government supply chain. So that's why Troops Direct exists. So just awareness, uh, obviously uh, charitable contributions would be terrific. Uh, TroopsDirect.org, we're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You could also email me at jake at TroopsDirect.org. And I'd be happy to take phone calls, answer any questions you have. Because this is personal to me. Uh, you know, I'm alive. Some of my guys are alive because of Troops Direct. And I'm all in on this organization. And I just want people to help help the service members as best well, they can. Well, you're a gleaming example of the type of uh, 
entrepreneurs we want to highlight on this um, podcast and show. And I, I appreciate you speaking up in the airport so that we had the chance to get to know each other and um, coming on the show. Thanks for listening to this episode of Increase the Thanks Dosage. For having me. To read really the full show notes for this episode, which includes any links mentioned, as well as a few quotes for sharing on social media, head on over to increasethedosage.show. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Startup Drugs, and that's drugs with a Z. Have an amazing week.